Hi, I'm Safa. Welcome to our first podcast. Um, today we're going to be asking Daniel Holly about the events happening in Bristol. And hi, I'm Mitzi. So you want to tell us about what you do um, for your work and just a bit about yourself. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and thank you for having me here today. I really appreciate it. So yes, my name is Daniel Holly, and I am a life and performance coach, primarily working with people who either work in an environment of equality, live in some facet of equality, or indeed have an identity, a value base personally, that is that that believes in equality. And I work also with schools and businesses to help build a more socially inclusive, or what I like to call socially cohesive space, which means it's safer for any person to walk into that space and genuinely feel like their anxiety, their nervousness, their sense of safety is minimized almost to zero because they know that where they are is home. They know they can express themselves, they can be themselves. And of course, both in school and in work and in our personal lives, we perform so much better when we're able to foster or have those environments fostered for us. So that's my work. A little bit about me is that this actually came from a massive identity search growing up. So um, to give you kind of the, the identifiers, yes, I'm mixed race. I'm half Jamaican, half British, but I grew up in Britain primarily. I'm actually six foot four. I'm a large guy. And so uh, growing up, I got this impression that I was very much the aggressor, right? I was the big lad. And of course, they call me Big Black Dan. So they had this character projected onto me where I would be the guy who would maybe end the fight. I'd never start the fight, but I'd end the fight. I'd be put in situations where people expected me to behave in a way that I was never going to behave. Actually, on the inside, I'm very sensitive, um, quite emotional at being, a very thoughtful, deep human being, and nothing like the stereotypes that people had laid on me. And as I grew up, I really wanted to explore that more. And so identity became the focal area in which I focused on what it really meant to be who we are. And of course, by having that conversation, it does mean naturally, we look at things like gender, we look at sexuality, of course, we look at race, and even more things than that, that actually put us in pockets in the eyes of other people. Um, it took me a while to get there though. And my time I've been a, a waiter, I've been a bin man, I've worked as a marketing executive, been an IT manager, I've actually worked in the video games industry as well, um, doing testing and so on. So it's been a, a quite an interesting time being me, but I've loved every second of it. And I think that's why I do what I do now, because I want everyone to enjoy themselves as much as I enjoy myself. Oh my God. Um, okay. So that actually sounds really nice. Like with the identity crisis, I kind of get that. Um, okay. Because I'm not going to get like really into it, but yeah i'm not straight to it and i didn't go through that but in like when i just started everything i was like i really wanted to look like mixed race if you know what i mean yeah yeah like the colored eyes and everything mm -hmm. so tell us about um look no what do you think about the events in bristol i have mixed feelings about the events in bristol thank you for sharing by the way i appreciate you sharing that that little story absolutely and it, it's it's nice because of course it it bridges those gaps it bridges those gaps for sure I'm, I'm, so i'm torn about the events in bristol more so I, it's it's really really magnificent for me personally to have experienced so many people from so many different backgrounds show up that's the thing that i think made me feel the warmest looking around at the march and going this is this is no longer perceived to be a black person's problem, right? Um, and actually, if you ask me honestly, it was never a black person's problem. Never a black person's problem, racism. Um, but it was perceived that way. But it was nice to see that actually it, it really turned into a problem that other people recognized was not just down to one race. This is everyone's problem that everyone absolutely needs to partake in for real change and real momentum to take place in this conversation. And that was wonderful. The, the vibe was positive. The energy was positive. It was incredibly peaceful, handled beautifully, and so on. Now, the part where it was a little bit bittersweet was actually where I, I couldn't help but think that in 2020, we're still having to do this. We're still having to have these discussions. We're still having to have these protests. And we're still having to take 
more action than simply pro uh, protesting for people to actually pay attention. And that's certainly been the focal point of what I've been saying on social media lately is that it's funny how people will say, can you please protest quietly, peacefully? Can you do it without bothering anyone else? And that's been happening. That's happened many, 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 many times throughout history, but no one has changed anything. The change has only happened when rather extreme cases have come up, really. And what that can speak to is an element of, if we want peaceful protests, then actually people need to listen before people get to that level. People need to wake up before it gets to that stage. And so that was what really came to me as the kind of other side of it was that we still have to do this. People still aren't aware, still aren't listening. And of course, I take that on my shoulders to go, right, well then, we need to share the information, share the education, and we really need to start letting people know that this impacts them too. Um, whether or not they think they're, an imp they're impacted by racism, it actually does. It may not just be in the way that they think it does. And it's quite pervasive, quite insidious, that, uh, that, that level of racism that's still being perpetuated today. I, I agree with you. Like, people need to be educated about it before going to protest about something that they don't know much about. Mm. Um, another question is, um, what advice would you give to young people dealing with these things? Oh, so it feels, it feels like a bit of a wet paper bag to say this. One thing, I think one of the main issues that I have certainly with regards to racism is it's, for those it doesn't impact, racism becomes a theoretical thing. It's not real, it's theoretical, right? And so in that, what you see is a conversation that has this underlying element of a lack of humanity, a lack of understanding of the loss of life and the lack of understanding of the violence on a person's body. And of course, against a person in terms of verbal abuse, for example, psychological abuse. And so actually the advice I would give to young people is to take on a journey of understanding simply the true value of your own life, not just in terms of the conjunction with racism or race or anything like that, but actually in conjunction with what your life can mean to you when you start to push towards the things you actually want in life and recognizing that that whole journey you go on has its own wonderful, beautiful, magnificent, colorful story that you have to tell. And if we are out there treating people as though they are not worth the voice, they're not worth the, the opportunity, the equality, the, the, the rights, the rights as everyone else, then what we're taking away is that. We're taking away that wonderful, magnificent experience of life from that person that we are starting to come to understand. And so that's actually the bit of advice that I would give to young people uh, today, because we've had the education available for a very long time. And I'm, I'm also directly experiencing working with schools that you can give someone information but actually it comes down to their very deeper set beliefs as to whether or not they actually take on the information or whether or not they just bypass it or decide to bring up something else to counter the information they're given. And so really what I'm experiencing is it really comes down to what do you believe about human life truly? And how are you making sure that you're living into that day after day after day after day? And one of the best ways I found is to start with your own. Give yourself love, give yourself some compassion, give yourself what you need in this world, and then transfer that into understanding that that's exactly what everyone else truly wants out here. It's just the opportunity to live the best life they can get. Um, another thing is that um, there is a problem in the black community yep. with black men, like sort of bashing black women and have almost lost their identity due to being fetishized. And is that a problem that we need to work on as well? Oh gosh, yes, yes. I don't, um, when, it comes to, when it comes to any form of prejudice or bigotry, I don't think it's just one siloed situation in which you know, it all just takes place in here. The conversation absolutely needs to move forward. And these are other things I talk about, which is why I talk so much about identity, is that there is, of course, this really unfortunate narrative um, with misogynoir, where basically, um, there's sexism and then there's sexism specifically geared towards black women and what what hurts on top of the fact of this level of humanity is the fact that black women actually are the most educated most compassionate 
And unfortunately, they shouldn't have to be, but are some of the strongest people I've met, and they shouldn't have to be, that the fact that we are condemning this and ignoring them based on, again, bias, based on uh, sexism and racism, just shows the, air, the, the level of work that we really need to do in order to combat all of these issues with equality among people. It's absolutely an issue and it's a really, it's a really, really damning one. Because actually, again, if you look through history, black women um, and actually even black trans women are the people who made all of this a conversation. They created this space. They made this happen. And so to, to condemn them in any way, shape or form is to condemn the very opportunity that you have at equality in this world. I can't put it any other way. Oh, that was really well said. Like, I haven't heard that. I, I haven't heard that from like um, a black man or who I generally know in like ever, like who I just know. Well, I don't really know you, but do you know what I mean? No, I understand it completely. I understand completely. Um, I hope that instills some hope in you. No, yeah, you really did. You really did, because it's just everywhere. I just think it's, it's sad. It's really sad. But mm -hmm. in England, like, um, so when me and Safra do go to school, we hear a lot of the time things to do with, so people will almost say something really racist, like, mm -hmm always touching our hair mm. or if we raise our opinion on something we're always we're deemed aggressive or just being maybe I don't know outspoken so I was thinking so then I was like that's almost casual racism and the fact that it's already installed in yeah. like people that young head do you think that that institutional racism is because it's never talked about is almost deemed as normal now in this country so it's oh my just god yeah yeah it's sorry, go on. please finish sorry pardon me so it's just acceptable now to almost say something completely so rude that has so much deep-rooted history mm -hmm. but just because you're not saying the n-word it's not deemed as racist yeah there's, there's, um, there's so many, and I, I've got to be careful now because I could talk forever about this. There are tangible connections between the way these microaggressions that take place against um, black and brown bodies that have a connection right the way back to the slave codes. And the slave codes were laws put in, in place, as, as it suggested, you know, it does exactly what it says on the tin, that were laws put in place to govern and manage uh, slaves. And they were things like um, a slave was only allowed to leave their house at a certain time of day. Um, a slave was not allowed to marry um, another person, another slave who belonged to another family. Um, and these were also uh, connected to elements. And there's actually a picture of this, a young black girl being, what's the word I'm, look I'm looking for? I'm looking for the right word. Oh, I'm, only, I'm gonna have to put it this way. A young black girl being displayed in a gated space, like a zoo, like a petting zoo, and there's white people lining the gates and they are literally touching her, reaching out and touching her, and literally all she's doing is just walking around this space, right? And this image is so powerful because it, it ties directly exactly to what you're talking about, where people actually feel like um, your bodies are just things to be looked at and touched and so on. And again, this, this also moves into this area that you mentioned earlier about black men, is that black women's bodies have been sexualized, they have been commodified, and as you know, they have been co-opted now as a sexual um, form because black women have had these body shapes for a very long period of time, and previously it was thought hideous. Now we're seeing more of this hourglass shape showing up, and now it's attractive because it's being you know, portrayed by other races of women. And so you, know, you can see directly this, this element of Black women, and unfortunately, there's the really insidious, again, message that black women and black bodies have lesser value implicitly. And that's why I talk about humanity, because we still are holding on to and denying and silencing and therefore normalizing the minimization of black and brown skin and black and brown bodies, black and brown lives. And again, it's pervasive in our language and our attitude, in our culture and our policy. It's just, it's present. The saddest part, again, is that the only people who will be able to see it 
and I, I think this may seem like speculation, but I'm going to roll with it. The people who really see it are the people who experience it and the people who are able to do the work to be able to, to transcend their own ego and their own reality, to be able to empathize with that experience and, and get it. And that's also saying that that's not even just black people um, in that just because you're black, you get it. There are many black people out there actually who don't seem to have a problem with it, who aren't bothered by it, et cetera, et cetera. But then there are also, there are also a lot of white people who do get that and don't need it explained to them because thankfully they were raised right. And they, know they, they already have that empathy in place. Um, but yeah, it's tangible right the way back to the, the uh, 15th century when, when um, the slave trade began with Britain. Um, you can see how these tangible microaggressions really connect to that. And, and yes, we've normalized it. The Britain have been very good at keeping their history very silent. So of course, now that it's being brought up, people don't want to talk about it because it's never been brought up. It's messing with their reality. Yeah, exactly. Like when black women have been wearing braids and they were made fun of it and called ghetto or their big lips were made fun of. And then all of a sudden it's a trend and yeah. white women are being appreciated uh, for yeah. having those features. I just think that's wrong. And um, do you think that you could come into school and speak to other BME students and educate them about um, everything that's going on? Because a lot of students don't know what's happening and mm -hmm. they're just assuming based off what they've seen and what yeah. they've like experienced. I would love to. Absolutely. I would love to do that. Um, as we said, you know, let's 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 educate people out there. Let's let them know what's going on, and let's see what they do with that information. For sure, I'd love to do that. And um, wait, hold on, it's not loading. Safa, do you want me to say it? Yes. It's not loading. So, oh wait, no, it's loaded. Oh my god, Safa, I'm just gonna say it. Okay. So, <laughs> when you were talking, we were just talking about what you were saying. Yeah. And we were going when you were talking about how um like black women have been sexualized and then how our culture has been mocked mm -hmm. from I can't remember what it's called. I think it's called like the Minstrel Show or something. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Minstrel and Show. And Bollywogs and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And now everybody wants it. You see the Kardashians mm -hmm. who, uh, who constantly want this figure mm -hmm. and everything. And then when you linked it back to slavery. So me, my, me and my mum are always talking about it. Like my mum's a bigger, bigger activist than me. Like okay. she was, she was like, um, it's funny because when you talked about the government keeping it quiet, they haven't even really um, made it known that slaves still haven't gotten their reparations. No. I think, um, but the slave owners and the people who owned the plantations have just got all that money. They just mm. finished paying it this year. Yep. But they've seen that very quiet. They did indeed but we haven't even been paid for, you know, 400 years of systematic oppression. No. And, and that, that's a really good point to raise, actually, because that's another blind spot in... I think it's always about... I always, excuse me, not always. It is about being able to equip yourself, of course, as you've shared right there, with that kind of information, not to, not to counter-attack people sharing their views and what they know about these things, but just to be able to gently challenge people's education and what they think is, you know, their, their own truth. So yes, absolutely. When, when people might say, oh, slavery was ages ago and so on and so forth, there's things like that, that very piece of information that actually when slavery ended, it was the slave owners who got compensation for their loss of property while the slaves were being left and not just left and were free, because all they knew was how to work the fields. So actually, the only, even though they were free, they were technically still just doing the same thing they did before. 
also while the and actually this is another interesting thing they say that slavery was abolished in 1833 and you'll hear a lot of people in britain say oh, i'm so proud that you know we were the first nation to abolish slavery even though we partook in it so heavenly uh, so heavily actually when you look at the information in 1833 we didn't abolish slavery completely we actually abolished slavery in many places we colonized except for india so we were actually still doing it up until 1861, which was 13 years after 1848, when the French abolished slavery. So, and I always put it in this example, if you've got two people in front of you and they both smoke, and one person says, I quit smoking on Monday, but I still have a cigarette on the weekends. And the other person says, I quit smoking on Wednesday and I never had a cigarette again. Who actually quit smoking first? So I, I, I think to myself, these are, the, these are the kinds of bits of information that need to be shared out there so that people recognize, and not, not to start having arguments, it's not about that. It's so that the clear history of how things went can be seen. So that actually there's, there's not so many, I think there's also not so many lies being told. There's a clarity on the fact that our nation, while it's Great Britain and so on, there are of course faults that we have. It's also about reframing what makes a great person, of course, we go into Churchill as well. And, um, and just making sure, primarily for the people who, again, theorize racism and act like it's just something that they can just discuss at their whim and not necessarily care about people's emotional stamina day to day, um, that everything that they thought they learned in school is not actually everything that took place in history. And it's really important that we, that we make sure that's combated, um, definitely. And yes, once uh, slavery was, even after slavery completely abolished, there was like hundred pound fines for people who would continue to uh, trade. But at the same time, people were still doing it. Um, British people were still trading slaves quite openly. They would have ships coming into docks with full on shackles and everything. But they'd say that was no evidence that they were still trading slaves. And because of the same unfortunate level of apathy that we're seeing today in response to these protests, in response to all of the deaths that have taken place just in the last month alone, is the very same apathy that took place back then, where slaves were still being traded illegally and no one cared. Going back to what you said about um, how um, people in Britain like are so proud that we were the first to abolish slavery it's almost the same thing happening now with people saying oh at least the uk isn't as racist as the us and we're a lot better with them but that doesn't change the fact that there's still racism here and it still needs to be dealt with it like it shouldn't be normal to have racism just because it's a lot less than another country mm. Um, here's another one for you. Um, and I'm actually, I, I, I'm going to say, I probably could give you about another 10 minutes. All right. But, <laughs> but I will, I'll share this one with you. Now, this is another fun, fun fact, fun fact. I'll put my bunny rabbit ears up. Um, so when British people say it's not as bad as in America, again, this ties to this element of humanity and understanding how important it is. So a study was done and there's a TEDx talk um, and I wish I can remember off the top of my head who it was who did this talk. You'll have to excuse me, I apologize. But there was a study that was done that showed that we understand that veterans, unfortunately, um, PTSD and veterans, unfortunately can be seen to go together like ham and bread. So, so there's a very common relationship that we understand with PTSD and veterans because, and we can understand it because they're out there on the front line. There's day to day, there's a risk of death. They, they lose people. They see things that no human being should ever have to see. And of course it is incredibly traumatizing. What they found was in this study was that a person who experiences microaggressions can reach the point where the same part of their brain activates and the same function in their brains activates similar to that of veterans who have PTSD. The brain behavior is very similar. Now this is fascinating only because again, when, Brit when British people might say, or when anyone actually says British, the British aren't as bad as the US, what we're doing is we're basically saying that physical violence is worse than psychological violence. Physical violence is far more impactful because it's, it's visceral. We know it, we see it, we feel it, it's connectable, we get it. 
But psychological violence is a lot harder to get your hands on. Psychological violence is a lot harder to, I say a lot harder, it's less common that people connect with that. It's less common that people see that, but it's incredibly real and has very, very real impact. And you could, of course, make the argument, well, to be honest, whether black people are mad or not, there's no surprise that they are if they are. Because there's a good chance. And, and again, we can't, we can't just say black people. We could say any person who experiences any form of microaggression in their life could come to that. Do you know what I mean? So we've got to, we've got to be able to make that connection of whether it's physical violence, psychological violence, verbal violence, it's violence. It doesn't matter whether it physically hurts or not. Things can be felt on a level that may not be seen until the behavior is triggered. And again, that's harder to track, but that could be what it is. Yeah, that's um, something like that has happened to me. Like some boys were making fun of me for having dark skin, mm -hmm. but it still hurt me as much as it would hurt me if they like physically hurt me because of it. Yeah. And um, I have a question. Okay. What do you think of um, the, some people who have started pushing the All Lives Matter movement to like get rid of the Black Lives Matter movement? Okay, so I, do you know, I've got my own stance on the All Lives Matter movement and it's, it's not controversial, don't worry. Um, the, the, again, there's a great, there's a deep sadness. I would, this is what I would love and I'll, I'll just put it this way because otherwise again, I'll talk forever. What I would love to see, and I dream of this and I want it to become a reality, is that Black Lives Matter, me too, feminism, trans lives matter, all of these movements where you actually have people taking real action, putting out protests, making events, you know, putting out literature, um, funding charities, doing actual work. If you imagine all of those movements came together under the, under the hashtag, all lives matter, it gives me shivers thinking about the astronomical impact that could take place if All Lives Matter was taken over by the collection of movements who are actually doing something. I don't really wanna talk about the people who are co-opting it to just silence Black Lives Matter, but I actually feel like it's a wasted hashtag at the moment, at the moment, because All Lives Matter, when you think about it, does, does have a genuinely really powerful message that could create a very, very powerful movement for the entire world for many, many people, more people than we could ever imagine, right? but it's being wasted right now. So I'd love to see every movement that is about humanity, that is about equality, that is about identity, about acceptance, et cetera, et cetera bond together, take that hash, just rip it off and be like, you're doing nothing with this, we're having it back and do something with it. Because there's, there's so much beautiful love, passion, positivity behind all of these movements together that, that they could, they could really do something. They've done enough as individual movements. They've done quite a lot with these individual movements. So imagine what they could do if they banded that energy together. And I think All Lives Matter absolutely deserves to be in their hands. That's what I think. Yeah, I agree with you there. And it's almost as if, because all lives do matter at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. But it's almost as if All Lives Matter was created by a group of white American conservatives who just mm -hmm. don't like anything not being uh, not being about them, if you know mm. what I mean. It's yeah. like almost being like, yeah, but Black Lives Matter, but you know, all lives matter. It's almost saying when people say white lives matter, of course white lives matter, but they're not mm -hmm. being harmed or oppressed every single day. So actually, what I'll what I'll challenge you on there is that. It's, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say that they aren't being challenged or oppressed. Maybe not racially, but there are swathes. I mean, bear in mind, this country is 87% white. There are, no, there are so many little towns and villages in this country that are, are indeed oppressed, but economically. They don't have access to things to allow them to grow. They don't have access to uh, things that allow them to flourish. And they are, they are being strangled, right? That is absolutely absolutely true and part of this racial discourse which is again being spun is to constantly ignore the fact that white people in this country are suffering too they really are but what i will say um is it's not so much that they're not oppressed or, or not suffering or anything like that it's actually the fact that they're not doing anything with it blm has 
done stuff, protests, again, funding, charities, move, all sorts of things, literature. They're, 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 and it's an active hashtag, right? It's an active thing. Me too, again, right? Feminism, again. There's, it's an active thing that they are doing something with and, and it's spread and it's done work. All Lives Matter has achieved, to my best knowledge, nothing. Nothing is being done with it. And again, that's why I say, give it to the people who are actually taking action. If, if, it would be interesting to see what action would be taken if All Lives Matter were taking action. And I, I do worry, in line with what you said, I do worry that I don't think they would really sit truly behind what they're saying. But, but at the same time, it would be interesting them to see action. And that's what's missing from that whole movement is the fact that they're not doing anything with it. If All Lives Matter, then make All Lives Matter. Make them matter. But, but they're not doing anything. And it is, like, like you said, it is just being used to silence these other movements. Because, of course, along all sides, All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter also came about. And it's like, was All Lives Matter not enough? So, you know, so I think that, that's, what I'm, that's what I feel is lacking there is just action. It's like, do something with it then. Because right now, all you're doing is using it as some mouthpiece on the internet. That's all it is. Um, and I, again, that's why I'd like to give it, give it to people who are actually taking action because they have a history of taking very powerful action time and time again. Yeah, completely. Yeah, completely, definitely. Like, for all lives, so all lives matter to actually matter, there just needs to be justice. Social justice for everyone, regardless of what religion you are, what race, mm -hmm. or... It doesn't even matter. Does no. everyone... No, exactly. So, absolutely. Right, and... It's, it just makes no sense, but I think Safa wants to talk, so I'll give it to her. Mm -hmm. If um, I may interject very quickly, sorry, Safa, I'm going to have to go very, very soon as I have uh, unfortunately got a, a, a commitment in about 15 minutes. So don't mind, can this be the last question? Is that all right? Um, it wasn't a question, I was just going to wrap oh, okay. it up. Oh, okay. right, okay, there you go. <laughs> Pardon me then, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Please, Safa, continue. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your opinions and your views and educating me on some stuff that I didn't know about. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. Really, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. It's been a lovely conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you.